Welcome to Korea and the World, a podcast on political, economic, and social issues from the perspective of the Korean Peninsula. Much of our knowledge about North Korea comes from a limited number of sources. Documents made public by foreign governments, de facto testimonies, correspondence in neighboring countries, and North Korea's official news agency. But what about intelligence agencies? How do they manage to gather intelligence? And how much do they actually know about North Korea? For this interview, we had the privilege to host Dr. Sumi Terry, who provided us with a unique look into the US intelligence community and its attempts to deal with North Korea. Dr. Terry is a senior research scholar at the Columbia University Weatherhead East Asia Institute and founder of Peninsula Strategies Incorporated, an advisory firm specializing in Korean issues. She has also served as the National Intelligence Fellow in the David Rockefeller Studies Program at the Council on Foreign Relations in New York. Prior to her academic and consulting career, Dr. Terry served as Deputy National Intelligence Officer for East Asia at the National Intelligence Council and also served as Director for Korea, Japan and Oceanic Affairs at the National Security Council during the George W. Bush and Barack Obama administrations. Earlier in her career, she served as Senior Analyst on Korean Issues at the CIA Directorate of Intelligence while she was a top-rated Korean linguist. Dr. Terry earned her PhD in International Relations from the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy at Tufts University. She holds a Master's in International Law and Diplomacy from the Fletcher School and a Bachelor of Arts in Political Science from NYU. Professor Sumi Terry, welcome to Korea and the World. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, you have served as a career intelligence officer. How did you choose this, well, definitely exciting but also uncommon path? After I got my doctorate degree at the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy, at Tufts, I really initially wanted to get into academia. But of course, you know, I had dreams. I just came from, from New York previously, and I had dreams of going back to New York. But you know how academia works. It's not like a position just opens up just because you wanted to go back to New York. So the schools that offered me positions were sort of very, very far away from where I wanted to be. Meanwhile, the Central Intelligence Agency came to recruit at the Fletcher School because that's what they do. They go to various international relations school programs such as Fletcher or John Hopkins Size or Columbia SIPA, Georgetown School of Foreign Service. So when CI came to recruit, I just, you know, for the heck of it, I, I kind of said, okay, why not try this out? But then when they actually offered me a position, I was very curious because I've been studying Korean politics and Korean history, but there's just not enough information about North Korea. And they said something very juicy during an interview. They said, well, if you want to know what Kim Jong-il eats for breakfast, why don't you come and work with us? So it was really more curiosity than anything else that kind of got me started um, working for the intelligence community. You grew up in South Korea. Part of your family is from North Korea. And you spent the better part of the last 20 years working on Korean issues for the American government. Um, can you draw a line between work and private life? Uh, what it is is that as a Korean American um, and having my entire paternal side of the family coming from North Korea and my birth father passed away when I was very young so my grandparents took care of me a lot of the times and so I'm, I was very very close to my grandparents so growing up I've been hearing a lot of stories about North Korea my family is, is product of just the division of the Korean Peninsula and the Korean War so I've seen that kind of sort of very personal longing about North Korea or suffering as a divided family just had, you know so I had that experience um, so it was, it was very interesting when I was working at the CIA as a North Korea analyst sort of just seeing it from that perspective, very, you know, security, defense, nuclear perspective, but sort of having that background of, you know, something more. So so it's kind of an interesting balance. You know, I am Korean-American, as you said, but I don't know about drawing line exactly, per se, yeah. Practically speaking, what is the role of the intelligence community in the American foreign policy apparatus? During your service, did you prepare daily reports for the White House um, and the State Department? What were you actually doing? The intelligence community supports policy making. So unlike some other intelligence agencies, particularly the NIS, National Intelligence Service in South Korea, which actually give policy recommendations. So in some ways it's politicized because you have to give policy recommendations and you know in a way what your politicians want to hear because they have a policy direction. 
in the United States, the intelligence community just give analysis and assessment of a situation. You're not supposed to give policy recommendation per se. Of course, at times you it is politicized or it is people think it is politicized. Like for example, during the Iraq War, did we give that kind of recommendation or not? But technically, you're not supposed to. Our job as intelligence analysts, therefore, is to give objective assessment of the situation on the ground, whatever country you're covering. Um, It's really to tell the truth to power. And the job really involves briefing the policymakers and writing the policymakers. So you, you write daily reports to the president called the president's daily brief, or you write a longer term intelligence papers or intelligence assessments, or you go down and face to face interact with policymakers and give oral briefing. Every policy briefing in the United States starts with an intelligence briefing, whether it's a National Security Council meetings or principal committee meetings or deputy committees meetings, it always starts with an intelligence briefing. So what type of kind of material do you normally work with? What are your raw sources, let's say? So as an intelligence analyst, you what you are is you are an all source analyst. So it's not the job itself it's not so different from let's say a think tank or academia when you're studying a country or studying a leadership or studying an issue. It's just that you are you go beyond unclassified open source reporting. So you have, for example, diplomatic reporting that all the embassies, US embassies in different places Right? We have an embassy in, in Beijing, we have a U.S. embassy in Seoul, you have a U.S. embassy in Tokyo, for example. So you use the reporting that they send you, that's called the diplomatic reporting. We also use human intelligence, that's sort of the human assets that we have recruited, um, who has something to say about North Korea. You have signals intelligence, sort of, now it's made famous by Edward Snowden, the signals intelligence, which are intercepts of, uh, let's say, phone calls or whatnot. So you have those. And then you also have imagery satellite imagery that comes out of the imagery department. And you also do open source reporting, right? All the folks who, who cover a lot of North Korean newspapers, like say Nodong Shinmun, who, who go really laboriously go through them and come up with their own assessment. So you are really using all available information to you to come up with an assessment. That's the only difference, really. Now, going on about the intelligence on North Korea specifically, last year you gave a talk for the NGO Liberty in North Korea in which you spoke about your work for the CIA dealing with North Korea. To quote, the CIA knows jack about North Korea. Intelligence is extremely poor. Why is that? Well, that's a controversial statement, so I'm sure CIA does not like me (laughs) to say that. But we call North Korea a hard target for a reason. It's one of the hardest targets in the world. It really is. Because, as I mentioned, human intelligence, let's just start with human intelligence. How do we get human intelligence out of North Korea? It's not like CIA guys can run a bunch of people, operators in North Korea, a bunch of white guys running around in North Korea. It's just not possible, right? So you really have to rely on South Korea or China. So human intelligence, it's, it's hard to get to any kind of activity in North Korea. Then what you're recruiting are North Korean officials outside of North Korea. But that's also very difficult because North Koreans are the mostly high, most highly trained people in the world. The kind of people that they send out Overseas are people who are who have deep ties uh, with the regime, or or they are indoctrinated uh, and they are trained. So it's really and they have certain security measures, right? You, it's impossible to separate them. People move in groups. North Korean officials don't act separately. They don't go to, go to the bathroom by themselves when they're overseas. So you have to be able to separate these people to be able to just even have an opportunity to have a conversation. So. Recruiting them is very, very difficult. Let's say you did rec- recruit them. Well, most of them mid-level officials from, I don't know, are operating out of Kuwait or what have you. But then what? Do we know what Kim Jong-un is going to think? Or what Kim Jong-il is? I mean, what, what do we know about the decision-making? What do we know about the you know, nuclear weapons and so on? These are mid-level guys. So human intelligence is poor. Similarly, other intelligence is poor. So we do have lack of intelligence when it comes to compared to other countries. Now, of course, you can still get a lot of information by, you know, we have important Korea scholars who do very, very important work uh, in, in open source reporting. But I just don't think necessarily, you know, we know so much about in, in the intelligence side. And it's not only CIA's problem, it's also other intelligence agencies' problem. Think about when Kim Jong-il died. I, I thought, wow, you know, this is time I need to be back at the agency. But, you know, people didn't know about it. Neither did National Intelligence Service, neither did China. 
people, the world found out about Kim Jong Il's death 48 hours later because North Koreans decided to tell us that he was dead. Otherwise, months could have gone by. Well, at least that's an exaggeration, but is that a common occurrence to have the intelligence services aware of informations at the same time as the general public? Yes, it's a common occurrence. That was that's a good example when Kim Jong Il died. Other times you might have information, but you're not, you know, months and years ahead. You you are maybe days ahead. Like you you might have just acquired that information, and then New York Times or other papers pick up uh, the news. But I think another problem is it that not only it's a lack of intelligence. I think most North Korea watchers, when we are thinking about North Korea, we really uh, don't understand their mindset because we continue to look at North Korea from our own viewpoint, from our own mindset, like Western mindset, versus trying to really get at their thinking from their their perspective. But what about South Koreans and? Chinese intelligence services. They don't have necessarily such a different mindset. They share a border with North Korea. Do they have access to better information or are they able to provide better analysis of the country because they're so close? I think there are, there are different strengths of different intelligence agencies. So I think South Korea, just by uh, the proximity and sharing the same culture and same language, might be able to do uh, human operations better. But of course, the American Central Intelligence Agency has better satellite and uh, just technical aspects. This is why it's important for South Korea, United States, and China too, if we could, um, or work together. But Again, it's not like NIS knew about Kim Jong Il's death until they decided to tell us. Because of failures such as the Iraq War, it has been argued that American intelligence, and especially the CIA, is dysfunctional. One reason given is that not enough attention has been given to the recruitment of contacts and country-specific expertise. Do you think the problems concerning North Korea are just linked essentially to that, or are there other problems? The problem with North Korea is twofold. One, just a general difficulty of Um, getting intelligence out of North Korea, as I just mentioned to you. And two, yes, there is a more systemic problem, as you just mentioned. The CIA and other intelligence agencies do want to, in theory, recruit hyphenated Americans or Americans who have deep cultural and ties uh, with, let's say, you know, Farsi-speaking Iranian American. But that's really in theory. When it comes to um, clearing these people, Um, it's it's a whole different game, right? So they never get cleared. Like myself, it took a, a very long time for for my clearance to get cleared, for me to get a clearance, uh, because again, I have extensive ties and relationship with South Koreans. I have a lot of relatives here still, and my grandparents uh, and my paternal side came from North Korea. So it's good in theory. It's just hard to execute in terms of implementation, and I do think that there's that systematic systemic problem. Um, since 9/11, intelligence has become some kind of buzzword. A budget and influence of intelligence agencies worldwide have skyrocketed. But is this a good thing? Is it desirable that the president's foreign policy be increasingly influenced by, well, for lack of a better word, spies rather than diplomats? Um, do they really have a better point of view than diplomats? And does it not emphasize the security aspect of the thing only, rather than cooperation or whatnot? Well, I do think there's room to cut. We do understand why there was a ballooning, um, particularly after 9/11, um, because you're in the United States was just homeland was attacked. But I do think that you know analysts' role is different from the operators, right? You say spies. As I mentioned, analysts are people who are researchers. It's like it's like a think tank. Right? When you go to see how you say it, it looks like a campus, and these are not some strange people in making conspiracies. These are just people, a very normal people who graduate from international relations program, who instead of going into a think tank get, get in there, and they face same problems as normal research scholars. They're just trying to put together a puzzle. So it's just a different perspective. They might have the same perspective as the any assessment that comes out of CSIS or the Brookings or, or Council of Foreign Relations. It's just yet another perspective that uh, for the policymakers because they are using available intelligence. So if it corroborates what X think tank thinks about it, um, a given issue, that's that's even better. So so I'm not sure about You know, just characterizing the whole agency as a bunch of spies. That's, that's only one aspect of what an intelligence agency does. We mentioned just earlier the difficulty of recruiting North Koreans for the purpose of intelligence. But in the past years, we've seen a growing numbers of defectors and more and more knowledge actually coming from North Korea itself. Are we both, the public and the intelligence community, actually getting better informed 
about North Korea thanks to that? Yes, I do think we are getting better informed thanks to a lot of defectors um, coming out of North Korea. And, you know, the more time we spend studying and thinking about North Korea, of course, we are getting better informed. Um, what I was referring to was that just North Korea being harder, relatively speaking, than any other country in the world in terms of trying to really get at understanding. Now, another problem, though, is that thanks to the defectors and uh, other reports, we understand a lot about um, situation at the bottom level or on the ground that's easier to understand. I still think what's really difficult for us to get at is regime intentions. It's one of the most difficult things for us to understand. What does Kim Jong-un regime intend to do? Is he bluffing half the time? Is he actually serious? You know, it's this kind of like leadership intentions that's still very difficult uh, because defectors wouldn't know that either. But in terms of regime intention, if a high-level defector was to join the United States, would he actually ever be able to get clearance to provide his own analysis of the country? Or would he just be relayed to simply a source of information? It would just be a source of information. Like Hwang jang would be a good example, uh, the senior most North Korean defector to defect out of uh, North Korea. You know, he had his own think tank in South Korea, and he traveled, and he spoke extensively about his own viewpoint. There are other defectors, North Korean defector right now, like Chang jin Sung, who, who's the author of the book Dear Leader. You know, these defectors are free to go and, you know, say what their viewpoints are on, on different aspects of North Korea decision-making and so on. So we'll just take all that into consideration. It's not like they will be on our payroll, you know, United States' payroll necessarily. As you argued, one of the results of this problem is that the outside world is, well, fairly bad at understanding North Korea's intentions and motivations. Fifteen years ago, the British academic Hazel Smith argued that we therefore tend to see North Korea as either bad and motivated by pure evil, or mad and driven by insanity. Um, do you think that today this is an accurate description of the perspective prevalent within the American foreign policy apparatus? Yes, we do want to simplify and label North Koreans, and I'm sure things are much more complex than North Koreans simply as bad or mad. But if North Korea analysts, there are scholars who think that they are bad, it is also because they have been acting bad. So I don't want to overly also complicate the situation. So I understand what Hazel Smith is saying, but at the, at the end of the day, it is North Korea's bad behavior or provocative actions that cause this kind of simplified, uh, us to characterize them in this way. You know, uh, what, what else is there? I mean, it's, I guess you can sort of come up with some deeper way to describe them, but there's a reason for why they are also characterized that way, right? Or if we call them mad, it's because when Kim Jong-un says we're going to blow up various movie theaters that's playing interview in New York City, I mean, it looks like it's a mad behavior. So yes, it doesn't seem sophisticated and it seems like it's oversimplifying, but it's also, you know, North Koreans are the one who's kind of, you know, they're the, they're, they're the cause of that in a way, you know. But at the level of intelligence, it makes sense since you have access to quite a lot of data. But what about the person who actually has to promote a policy or to take decision? Doesn't that very stereotypical perception of North Korea limit their field of action? I don't think so. I think the policymakers are very sophisticated. They, the North Korea policymakers right now are not the people who just came in uh, to the scene a day ago. People like Sid Silo, who works, works on Six Party Talks. These, these guys have been around for a very long time and been looking and watching, observing, studying North Korea uh, for a, a long period of time. So they understand it. And if we're making a policy this decision, it's based on how North Korea has been acting. Uh, it, it, it's really based on our experience of dealing with North Koreans. So if right now we're not in a mood to deal with North Koreans or in terms of engage them, because if we have engaged them, we have discussed, we have talked to them. So I do think that we need to give a little more credit to the policymakers who are working on the North Korean issue. These guys have been around for a very long time, and I do think there is a deep understanding of them. People like Ambassador Song Kim, people like Seth Seiler, people like Danny Russell, they understand what North Korea is all about. At the beginning of the talk we mentioned earlier, you addressed the young audience in front of you saying that they need to help you in terms of shifting the narrative. Are you implying that the old guard of North Korean experts is actually locked in a certain narrative? Well, what I'm saying is there has been over-focus on the nuclear issue only when it comes to North Korea and not 
enough on humanitarian concerns, not enough on the changes that's going on on the ground with the market economy, with information going into North Korea. We have been just overly focused on denuclearization effort only. And as you know, that issue has, it's just an intractable North Korean problem, the nuclear program. And I don't see a, a solution coming to us anytime soon. So that's what I'm saying. It's like the narrative shouldn't only be about denuclearization. It should be on a whole host of issues, including human rights, including humanitarian concerns, including what's going on in the, with the people on the ground, in, including our maybe long-term strategic picture. What, what do we want to achieve with the Korean Peninsula? Not just denuclearization. But how would that actually change our understanding of North Korea? If you were to take that bottom-up approach, that people approach, how would that change our actual approach when dealing with North Korea? Instead of just focusing on denuclearization, we think about, even just from the intelligence community, different ways to get information into North Korea. How do we get information to the public? Uh, we know information is flowing into North Korea from China. Uh, so we should focus on what kind of information, targeted information, who can we reach? And even to getting to the elites, how do we get to the elites so that they understand maybe you know there is a future even without North Korea. So my point is it's not just about how you know the nukes, 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 nuclear weapons, which has been we've been overwhelmingly obsessed with. Of course, nuclear weapons is extremely important, particularly now that North Korea's capability, um, nuclear capability, is really rapidly expanding and improving. But again, there's not an easy solution to that. So my focus is let's 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 think of some other ways to get at North Korean problem. Talking hypothetically, you say giving more information to the North Koreans, but who will you reach? I mean, the bottom part of North Korea has no power of action and is mostly concerned, it seems, with finding food for the next day. And at the same time, the higher part has no incentive on changing because it would most likely be charged as criminals against human rights. Right. But we still can. I mean, it's instead of like those balloons you know, going into North Korea that just randomly drops propaganda, uh, we can still make a more targeted effort of reaching both the public and the elites. Now, with the elites, you're absolutely right. Elites used to have a vested interest in keeping the status quo and keeping the system going. In fact, elite support uh, for the Kim regime has been one of the most the key pillars of regime stability. That's how North Korea kept its regime afloat through Kim Il-sung, Kim Jong-il, and all this time. You have to have elite support. So even during the famine years when millions of North Korean public is dying, it's okay as long as the elites support the regime. The regime then can continue. But right now, with Kim Jong-un having changed some 70 senior elites, I think there's more turmoil among the elites than people realize. And Kim Jong-il used to give elites the luxury goods and whatnot, and you used to use fear tactics as well. But the elites must feel like their fate is tied to the regime to keep the regime going. But I think the elites right now are fearful of Kim Jong-un. I mean, wouldn't you, if you are, if this guy can get rid of Chang sung tae his, his uncle, he can get rid of, you, anybody can be uh, gotten rid of. So I think if we can find ways to identify certain elites that are different reform-minded or, or, or have a different approach. And somehow, if you can get some message into some of these elites that there is possible future, you know, I think we have more of an opportunity now than ever before. Uh, it's not going to be easy. North Korea is not easy. There's no real solution. But it's just because of all the uncertainties at the leadership level, I think we do have an opportunity, at least more than before in the past. And on the American side, so you're hopeful that this narrative change will happen from nuclear to humanitarian issues? No, I'm not hopeful because, <laughs> because nuclear issue is such a priority. But it is evolving, right? Uh, there's more attention being paid to the human rights issue before. It's not that the United States didn't care about the human rights issue. President Bush, for example, did very much he was very much concerned about North Korean humanitarian situation and human rights issues. He even invited Kang Cho-hwan, the author of the Aquarium of Pyongyang, to the Oval Office. You know, he's still very much engaged on that issue. But I think now, given the intractability of the nuclear problem and understanding that that problem cannot be solved, I think there is finally a shift in terms of just looking around and seeing what else can we do uh, with North Korea. And so the dialogue is now has, it's expanding to include human rights issue, conversation about North Korea, about human rights issue, or other issues too, because also just, there's just no solution with North Korean nuclear program with that particular issue. So now you are working as a professor at Columbia University. Did leaving the government and joining the academic world actually 
change your perspective uh, on North Korea? Not really. <laughs> no. Uh, what's helpful is to be able to uh, freely speak and exchange ideas, uh, which is a difficult thing to do when you're in an intelligence community now that I'm out of the government. But, you know, my views of North Korea has been shaped by every single day looking at all the intelligence available on North Korea for 12 years. And it's not only from CIA, you know, you know whether I was at the NSC, you know, you know, from the policy perspective. So I think my viewpoints, you know, I've been accused of being a more of a hard line when it comes to North Korea, but I think that's just been shaped by just looking into North Korean issue from intelligence perspective for over a decade. But now you do, that you don't have access to secure intelligence anymore, do you feel like you're missing something, that a part of the puzzle is just beyond your reach? No, because as I mentioned, it's not like we were sitting on, in, on the gold mine of information. You know, for example, that's why when I thought when Kim Jong Il died, I'm like, oh, my CIA colleagues must have known about it, and this is, you know, why am I not there? But they didn't know about it. So, um, and if whatever they know, they know maybe a week before the New York Times gets it. So, no, I don't feel like we're missing some big information. Um, yes, on a tactical level, maybe there are some things that, that I'm missing, but, you know, macro level, it's not true. And, and we pretty much share a similar assessment. I mean, the Korea Watchers community are not, you know, there's not one thing that CIA knows and nobody else knows, and I know that. The only thing that I miss about being at the CIA is this. When I was at the CIA and I used to go to conferences and all these scholars and Korea watchers would just make these grandiose assessments about exactly what's going on in North Korea, at least I had 100% confidence that they didn't know what they're talking about because we didn't know that. So how could you know that? But right now when you know somebody else says, like, hmm, so there's a little bit of a doubt. Am I missing something here? So there's only that insecurity. But in, in general, I know that it's not like the CIA is sitting on information that nobody else knows. So to conclude... How can we, both the public, policymakers, and the intelligence community, actually get a more realistic image of North Korea? You know, I think it's just the best thing for us to do is to be humble about what we don't know. And I know that a lot of Korea watchers, you know, we debate all the time and everybody's so certain, but we need to be more humble about it. We shouldn't be certain. How do we know, right? So if we have that kind of humility and understand our lack of understanding about North Korea and just work with each other in terms of sharing information and have a professional approach on different ideas, right? Because you know we have sort of the hardline camp or the engagement camp or the more liberal camp and progressive camp. And we know who we, we are, right? I mean, I can name everybody in a spectrum exactly where their viewpoint is on North Korea. But if we just have respect with each other and have candid discussion um, and have humility uh, over how much we don't know, I think collectively, you know, that's the only thing we can do. Professor Terry, thank you very much for your sure. time. Thank you so much for having me. This was Korea and the World. To make sure you don't miss our next episode, bookmark our website, koreaandtheworld.org, subscribe to our podcast on iTunes, and follow us on Facebook and Twitter.